Good evening. My name is Lauren Jones. I'm a deacon here at Mercy View. Tonight we will be reading from Romans 15, verses 8 through 13. Starting with verse 8. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all peace and joy in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good evening. My name is Brad. I'm one of the pastors here at Mercy View. And uh, this is a special evening because you are going to get an opportunity to hear from a new voice from this, uh, this sacred spot. Uh, many of you know Corbin uh, King. Corbin and his wife Olivia are partners with us here. Corbin is also a pastoral resident with us here. And um, the Lord is doing a great work in Corbin's life. As a part of the uh, residency, um, one component of that is something we call a preaching lab. And the preaching lab is an opportunity for our residents to uh, prepare and practice what it's like to preach. And they get feedback from us in real time to help them grow and be encouraged. And um, we have been so encouraged by the growth that we've seen in Corbin. Um, We just felt like it was time um, for you to have an opportunity to be served by him, and I know that you will be. And so uh, I want to pray for Corbin as we get going uh, this evening and ask the Lord to to have his way among us. Lord, thank you for my brother Corbin, and thank you, Lord, for your hand on his life. And we pray that this evening, as your word goes forth, you would use him, that he would be a vessel for you. Um, Lord, we, uh, we recognize what we come under right now is not a, a man, but under the word and under the authority of that word. And Lord, we, uh, we ask that you would use Corbin to help us see you this evening through your scriptures. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. All right. Thanks, Brad. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me pretty good? All right, cool. Well, a few years ago, I worked at the Apple Store here in town and had a really amazing experience there. And probably one of my favorite aspects of that job was just how much time and exposure I got with unbelievers and the unchurched here in our community. Growing up, I've had different seasons where I'm in sort of a Christian bubble. And so to be in a space where the majority of everyone weren't in the same, you know, Christian circles that I was in was kind of refreshing, especially as someone who's passionate about sharing the gospel. And so there were many interactions that I had that were really positive. So much so it led to, you know, having coffee dates, lunch dates with different guys, getting to impact the gospel even more. And so my time there was a really sweet season. Ironically, the worst and most combative experience I had was with another Christian coworker. And so he was a undergrad student studying theology, and here I am, a seminary student doing the same thing. And I'm not being hyperbolic. We literally disagreed on every secondary issue you can think of. And not only that, but he loved to debate. Like, he was on the debate team. Like, it was just like the perfect storm of two cage stage theology students who think they know everything after one year of studying and reading, like, two books. And so here we are clashing, and it was mostly just the two of us on the side, but there was one day that uh, we had a really heated debate, and unfortunately, it took place in our break room. So debate's good, it's a good thing, but it's not necessarily appropriate uh, when you're on break at the Apple Store. And so there we are with about 10 of our coworkers who totally overheard that entire conversation. And I remember afterward having the realization of just how inappropriate and unattractive that must have been for those around us. All of the great conversations I had up to that point had been likely contaminated by that one moment. What about the interaction would possibly draw someone toward Christ? And even though he and I are family, 
we acted like enemies. Even though he and I had been saved by grace through faith in Jesus, we were putting way too much weight and significance on far less important things. And in doing so, we were muddying the waters of faith instead of bringing clarity for our friends to taste and see just how good the Lord is. What we needed was a shift of focus. We were in the weeds. What would it take to get there? In our passage today, the Apostle Paul is aiming to shift the focus of the Roman church off of themselves and towards something much more important as well. This evening, we're going to continue to build upon the main ideas that both Brad and Trey have walked us through these last few weeks. And tonight, we'll be concluding Paul's teachings on Christian ethics and the life of the church. Where in Romans chapters 1 through 11, Paul is explaining both the Jewish and Gentile needs for the gospel. And in doing so, what is the gospel? Then, of course, in chapters 12 to 15 are the practical outworkings of the gospel on the Christian life. And so today, in chapter 15, verses 8 to 13, Paul is essentially summarizing the main ideas of his entire letter and is seeking to help the Roman church understand, be encouraged, and to faithfully endure through two critical ideas related to God's perspective and our own. So if you want to take notes tonight, uh, these will be the two main points we'll cover. First, that God has a vision for his people. God has a vision for his people. And second, this vision helps his people to envision their world. Right? So second, this vision helps his people to envision their world. So our first main idea, that God has a vision for his people. First, that God... First, God's vision for his people is that they would be one, right? He wants them to be one. In in this part of our passage at the beginning, Paul is looking to create greater unity by reminding the Roman Christians of the bigger picture. Remember that Paul is speaking into a church struggling to peaceably exist as both a group of Jews and Gentiles. This is really uncommon for them. This is brand new for all of them. And it's believed and is very likely that the stronger Christians that we've been looking at these last few weeks were Gentile believers and some Christian or and some Jewish Christians who are beginning to find it easier to accept and enjoy the freedoms granted in the new covenant. While the weaker Christians were Jewish believers struggling to accept these newfound freedoms in the new covenant, such as no longer having to adhere to older cultural and ceremonial laws, things that they grew up on, heard day after day, and was ingrained in them. And so using my sanctified imagination, I can see this issue leading Gentile Christians to be condescending toward their Jewish neighbors and be condescending toward many aspects of their culture and their history. And so speaking to that half of the issue in verses 8 and 9, Paul is going to humble the Gentiles by reminding them, as it says, Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness. And in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. And in order to, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So the circumcised mentioned here are the Jewish people who were marked by circumcision and their unique laws to set them apart from their neighbors and to point their neighbors to the one true God who had revealed himself Israel. This God who is Yahweh, the one true God, working out his one true plan of redemption through many promises that he made to the many leaders of Israel's past. Promises such as a child that will come from Abraham's family, and through this child the nations will be blessed. Or a son of David that will reign and rule on the throne forever. Or the covenant with Moses. And that anyone who follows the law and is righteous will dwell in the presence of the Lord forever. And so these verses are telling us that Jesus is the Jewish Savior that eventually comes and fulfills these promises. In his earthly ministry, he primarily focused on ministering to the Jews. Because they were the best context and people to begin preaching the gospel. Since they share the same belief in the one true God. They share the same scriptures. And they've been looking forward to the coming Messiah, which was, of course, himself. And so Paul makes it a point of emphasis to remind everyone that Christ was a Jewish Messiah, raised up from that people in accord to the promises that God gave to that specific people. 
And it's from God's faithfulness to choose and use Israel despite their many failures that salvation has been accomplished for the world. Therefore, there's no need, especially for the Gentile believers in this situation, to resent or have any animosity toward their Jewish friends, to be dismissive or to completely get rid of the Old Testament and their history, their culture. Theologian T.F. Torrance wisely points out that apart from the covenant forged in sheer grace with undeserving and rebellious Israel and the unswerving faithfulness of the divine love of God, we would not be able to understand the mystery of our restoration to union with God through Jesus Christ. Apart from the context of Israel, we would not begin to understand the bewildering miracle of Jesus. Or as pastor and professor Doug Moose simply puts it, Paul here is reminding them, that is the stronger Christians, that although they've been grafted into the vine like we covered earlier in Romans, the status that they now enjoy rests on a Jewish foundation. And it's on that foundation that is the root that supports them in everything they believe. It's critical for the sake of unity that the Gentiles do not forget that they've been included in God's plan of redemption because of mercy, not because of privilege. And it's God's mercy that's been extended to them on the foundation of God's relationship and work through the nation of Israel and the Jewish Messiah that God raised from that people. Now, to the other half of the conflict, Paul is speaking to the Jewish believers and the different issues that they had as well. Understandably, they must have struggled to understand all the changes in God's new covenant and how the people of God are no longer one ethnic people group, but are now the universal church that is going to expand throughout the entire earth. Throughout Paul's letter and in his other writings as well, he has to help Jewish believers understand God's work of including Gentiles. Or that there's a difference between ethnic Israel and spiritual Israel. Or that Gentiles don't have to obey the strict Jewish laws regarding culture, ceremonies, special days, and so forth. What Paul is doing is he's pastorally walking them through this crucial aspect of the gospel. And he does so by briefly laying out the story of the Old Testament and how God had always been intending to include Gentiles and his redeemed children. And so the different quotations we see from the Old Testament that Paul uses in verses 9 to 12 were purposely chosen because they come from the three divisions of the Jewish Bible, the law, the prophets, and the writings, which are the poetic and wisdom literature. Meaning what, right? Meaning that Paul is showing them the whole Bible is about God saving sinners, not only out of Israel, but out of the entire earth. That has been God's heart this entire time. That's what God's been working toward this entire time. Therefore, Jewish Christians are to accept their Gentile neighbors who believe in Jesus Christ as their spiritual family. Not step-siblings or a subset of Christianity. They are to be one unified people. Culturally diverse? Yes, of course. And that's good. That's not bad. But exclusively united around the gospel, the person of Jesus Christ, the triune God, the revealed word of God, and to be called the church of God. And best of all, from these first few verses, is the greatest takeaway, which is that God has been ultimately, infinitely merciful to every one of us. Pastor and professor Tom Schreiner helpfully reminds us that Israel was a people created by God out of mercy. Who is Israel but a people from the family line of Abraham? And who is Abraham but this random guy who worshiped pagan sun and moon gods until one day God graciously revealed himself to Abraham and chose him to bless the nations. And so, mercy of you, for us today, as we navigate life together, let us recall God's mercy toward each of us. The beautiful mercy gifted to us that we even exist as a church, that the gospel has reached as far as the United States and continues to expand throughout the entire earth that we've been regenerated from death to life because we've gotten to hear the good news of the gospel. That God has not given up or grown tired in saving and preserving weak people like us. No, instead, it's his great joy to redeem us, to make us whole, to make us beautiful. 
That's why our unity is so important to him. And so now Paul's second main point from our first main idea is that God's vision for his people is that they are one united people saved for worship. It's on the heels of this last point that I'd like to quickly include one addition to Paul's bigger picture for the church. First, he said that they're one, and they are made one out of God's kindness and mercy to everyone. But now, he's making a key point in the different scriptures that he uses. And here's my question for you. What is it from those Old Testament passages that Paul quotes? What is it that the Gentiles are doing when God grafts them into the people of God? They're worshiping, right? Let's quickly examine what Paul quotes for us. 2 Samuel 22.50 Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Deuteronomy 32.43 Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Psalm 117.1 Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let the peoples extol him. Friends, we've been created to worship God. That's ultimately what this is about, and Trey did a great job hitting on that last week. That's the point of everything. And so central to any faithful church's identity is to be a people formed through worship and actively forming new worshipers in discipleship. That should be our aim and our cause. That we would be worshipful in how we work, in our relationships and families, and that in our greater context and city, Mercy View would be known as a people who love the Lord and live for him in all things. So when we pursue doing community together, let us make sure that God is central in why we gather and that our greatest desire would be for one another to be loved and encouraged through reminding each other, singing together, and praying together the truths of who God is and what he is doing in each of our lives. When we show up to work each week, let us lock arms with other believers and be faithful witnesses to the gospel not blending into the culture or distracting others from the gospel because you're blasting the volume on your differences and your preferences, such as my coworker and I that I shared about earlier. The Holy Spirit, from that really bad example I gave, convicted me and helped me realize how off course I was getting. I was faithful with unbelievers, but with this brother in Christ, I was completely in the wrong and off course. And so the Spirit was helping me realize that he and I need to be committed to being salt and light. That's our objective as brothers in Christ. And from that point on, we would pray together. We even geeked out over the theology we had in common. We shared the gospel together. And we encouraged one another in ministry, especially as he has gone on to seminary himself. And so when God graciously saves us and adopts us into his family, the goal is not to then compartmentalize God or to make him subservient to our fixation on a cultural or less significant theological issue. Instead, we are to come together to pursue a deeper relationship with the Lord and with one another, not diverging further from each other over things that disrupt a united pursuit of glorifying God. Our second main point this evening is how God's vision for his people helps them to then envision their world. So we talked about God's big picture for the church, right? But now Paul's going to help us see three ways for how God's people should envision their world in their day-to-day life. And he does it in an interesting way. He does it through a prayer there in verse 13. There Paul prays, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. The first way that God wants his people to envision their world is with hope. So what is hope? The word for hope that it's used here means expectation. And the second time hope is used at the end of verse 13, it's written in such a way that it actually means the thing hoped for is secured and is guaranteed. So this is far unlike how we use the word in our culture, right? Where there's sprinkles of pessimism in there because honestly, we want to guard our hearts in case the thing we want to happen might not work out for us. But friends, 
It not only has worked out for us in Jesus Christ, it's been worked out by Jesus Christ when he got on the cross and paid the price for your sins and mine and then rose from the dead. The late pastor and apologist Tim Keller said this at the end of his life as an encouragement to younger Christians anxious about the future. If Jesus Christ was actually raised from the dead, if he actually got up, walked out of the tomb, saw hundreds of people, talked to them, if he was raised from the dead, then you know what? Everything's going to be all right. And so my favorite teaching on hope comes from the pen of Peter when he wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, proclaiming that he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power is being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Friends, don't forget or lose sight of the one in whom you place your trust. It is in God who created and now is redeeming a people unto himself. And the salvation that God offers us cannot be taken from us or lost. If God was faithful to fulfill his promises in sending Christ to die and rise again, he will be faithful to raise us up with Christ as well and to eternally love us as his redeemed children. Therefore, I am not at all bothered when Christians are ridiculed and that we're told Christianity is an opiate of the masses, meaning that religion is a form of escapism or a way to view your troubles in this world with rose-tinted glasses. The truth is, I don't think this criticism goes far enough. The gospel is not simply a pain reliever that momentarily takes our minds off the problems of the world. The gospel is a defibrillator, resuscitating dead people back to life. And so what God is doing is he's overcoming and restoring what was ruined by the fall, not masking over it. And us gathering together this evening is not a form of escapism. It's us uniting together with God to push back the darkness in the world and to see the kingdom come. Therefore, we do not take lightly that we have the real message of hope in a hopeless world. Your neighbors, coworkers, and family are desperate and clawing after the very thing that you have, especially in the face of uncertainty, such as a possible oncoming recession in which there could be significant changes and struggles for many families. And yet, we have a real and lasting security in Jesus. Our treasure is in heaven where, ro- where moths and rust cannot destroy. Or in the face of loss of precious life, we have hope in one who will resurrect our bodies, electing to save people from infants to those in their old age and on their deathbeds. Because for our Western culture, material and financial loss, or worse, death, are the worst imaginable things that could happen to someone. And understandably so, like if this life is all you have, you want to keep it as long as you can and make the most of it. But we know that that leads to a hopeless place, if that's all you've got. Friends, we have good news for our friends and family and the gospel. And for those who have not yet met Jesus and believed his gospel, Because Jesus has removed the sting of death and has made a way for us to have eternal life with God. And it will be in a new and better world where suffering, tragedy, and loss are no more. A second way that God desires his people to envision their world is with peace. Another distinguishing mark of the believer is the fruit of peace born out of hope. For all of us, our greatest needs have been met in the person of Jesus. And so this peace between Jew and Gentile that Paul prays for is real and possible. And if we can have peace with God through Jesus, then God can accomplish peace between even the worst of enemies or provide inward peace in the face of the most difficult circumstances. And so your love for one another, despite the church being this eclectic group of unlikely friends, allows the church to be a unique witness to a deeper and more profound community that the world fails to offer. Now, lastly, the way that God wants his people to envision their world is with joy. 
The hope we have is how people like King David could genuinely enjoy God's presence in the face of deadly adversity. Or how the Apostle Paul could enjoy the presence of God and his promises while in prison. And so, even though the authorities that imprisoned Paul may have lived lavish lives, their lives were actually swallowed up in complete spiritual darkness. All the while, Paul is experiencing the glory and beauty of God in the darkness of a cell. So, what does this mean? Paul had serious joy from his life devoted to Jesus. So much so that even if they threatened him with death, he says, so what? I'll just get even more of Jesus through death. That is joy from a hope secured. And yet, joy in the Christian life does not mean that we do not suffer or that it's wrong for us to experience the emotions of pain or sorrow. Paul certainly cried and did not enjoy his suffering. And even Jesus wept despite knowing he would would raise Lazarus from the dead. Expressing emotions is not always sinful or to be dismissed. If that were the case, a lot of the Bible would have to be removed or edited, such as the Psalms. It's also okay to have seasons of uncertainty or doubt. But by no means do you want to live your whole life there, because to begin with doubt in regard to everything only leads to despair. And you will never get to rest in the truth, which has ultimately been revealed in the person of Jesus. You see, the beauty of joy is that it's a deep-seated happiness gifted to believers through the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us. This same Spirit that is gifted to us when we believe the gospel. The very Spirit that preaches to us that we are God's children and pours the love of God into our hearts. He is the down payment and seal of what God has done in salvation and reminds us that what God has begun in us, he will bring to completion. And so key to having joy is what Paul says, that they have joy in believing. Joy does not come through striving or performance or having perfect emotions, perfect happiness in response to everything. Joy comes from believing that the gospel is actually true for you today and tomorrow and the next day. And that the benefits of the gospel are true for you today and tomorrow and the next day. Finding comfort and delight through trusting that God is with you and he goes before you and he actually delights in you. Joy comes from believing that Jesus is enough for me. Joy will never come through the never-ending pursuit of the perfect job, right? The best neighborhood, having a bunch of fun hobbies, or going on exciting vacations. No, it's from knowing and believing that Jesus is enough for me. Therefore, it is well with my soul, no matter what. I recently heard a story from a pastor about one of his congregants, a woman who he visited at the hospital after her two-year-old son drowned in a pool. And as it turns out, the pastor happened to be there when the little boy died. And in the face of losing her son, she turned to her pastor and asked him, Pastor, can we please sing the doxology? The pastor said he felt like he was standing on holy ground in that moment with her. And so together they sang, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The point in sharing the story is not to say that this is how you should instantly respond to tragedy. In fact, her response is actually shocking. And it's no doubt that she grieved. What I want us to wrestle with is why, or rather how, could a mother possibly react that way in that moment? I'd say it's because she was a woman of genuine hope. She knows her God and has a big view of him, both of his character and his sovereignty over all things, that he giveth and he taketh away, and that God is worthy of worship more than the good things he does for us. Like, all of that is true. And yet, that's not all that is true. He is also a merciful God, 
who has not forsaken us in this life, but is ever present and even humbled himself to the point of putting on flesh, suffering, and dying to overcome the sting and curse of death from sin. She was praising the triune God who has secured hope for her and her family in the person of Jesus and his resurrection. And so as our time together comes to a close, let us not forget why Paul is making such a big deal about unity around worshiping and glorifying God versus being divided over less significant cultural and theological debates. According to Paul, and earlier in chapter 15, verses 4 to 5, at the heart of Paul's correction is his desire that they would be encouraged and they would faithfully endure to the end. And the only real way to endure in this life is to find your hope in the gospel, to turn from your sins and to trust in the person of Jesus. Friends, above all else, more than anything, I just want to make it to the finish line. Amen? I just want to finish this race well. Not to always be right, but to be among the righteous in glory. Therefore, I need you, and you need one another. And we all need more of Jesus. And it will be our united voices glorifying God that will continue to help us be re- to reset, be renewed, and to return to the path of life when we are prone to wonder. Let's pray. Thank you.